What's up, everybody? It's the Alex Leak and Friends NFL Podcast, back for another week. Um, I'm your host, Alex Leak, and we have a special guest with us on this week, uh, former Washington Husky, uh, 14-year NFL vet safety uh, for the Colts and the Seahawks, Nesby Glasgow. Thanks so much for coming on, Nesby. Hey, my pleasure. How are you doing today? Pretty well. Um, excited to have you on for this interview. This is cool. Um, so let's uh, let's start at the beginning. Um, growing up, did you always love football, um, or did you play any other sports along the way? Uh, actually, I played all the sports. When I was coming up, that's all we did. We didn't play video games. <laughs> we played sports. So uh, yeah, I played baseball, basketball, football. Uh, when I got to high school, I did track. Uh, so I mean, sports has always been a part of who I am. Nice. Uh, did you always love football? Was was there always a separation that uh, you liked football more than the others, or were you just better at it? No, my baseball coach always thought I was going to be a pro baseball player. In okay. fact, uh, I would say that Mr. Peters probably put more black athletes from the L.A. area into professional baseball than probably any other, any other coach, uh, you know, from... Uh, I can't, the only one I can think of now is Kenny Landro, but I mean, there are a bunch of guys that played for him and say the same thing that I'm saying about Coach Peters. He did a great job of uh, not just coaching us, but mentoring us. Okay. That's cool. It's good to have good coaches like that, especially coming up uh, through high school and stuff. Uh, where did you play your high school ball at? I went to Gardena High School in Gardena, California. It was. Uh, Outside of Compton, I was supposed to go to Compton, but I played Pop Warner uh, football with Gardena. And uh, in the ninth grade, my godparents that lived in Gardena talked my mom into letting me move in with them as a ninth grader. I went to Terry Junior High School, which is in Gardena. And that way, when it was time to go to, go to Gardena, uh, there, wouldn't be, there wouldn't be an issue. And I think that's probably the best thing that ever happened to me was given an opportunity to go to Gardena High School. We were city champions my junior year, and we should have been city champions my senior year, but that's another story. Nice. That's cool. I was glad that worked out that way. Um, coming out of high school, what was your recruitment like, and uh, what what led you to attend the University of Washington? Uh, Don James, uh, out of all the coaches that I, I spoke with and, and met, uh, I, I, for some reason, I just thought he was the genuine guy to come play for. Uh, uh, I was the number one group for the University of Washington. It's not the University of Washington, but the University of Hawaii when I came out. They kept me a couple extra days. And, you know, uh, unbeknownst to a lot of people, they're going to fly me home twice a year. And then the defensive back coach said he would fly me home for a third year. Uh, but... Uh, Washington, I, I just felt good about when I met the players that were there and what they had to say about Coach James. I mean, to be there at, at a short time and to say that, you know, they were extremely happy that he had taken over at the University of Washington, uh, it, it just kind of relaxed me because uh, I got recruited with a guy by the name of Antoine Richardson, and I got a chance to talk uh with uh, Al Burleson and uh, Roberto Jordan because they they were two seniors. They were two seniors, like, uh, they played the same high school that went to Washington, like Anthony and I. Okay. And what they had to say about Coach Jay was inspiring to me because they hadn't, they hadn't played a football season with him, but they just talked about the change that he made at the University of Washington. How much more comfortable they were, they were playing for him. And they just said that, you know, uh, this would be a great opportunity for me to come and play at the University of Washington. And I trusted those guys wholeheartedly. And, you know, and it was a, it was great because, you know, they had played high school ball together. We had played high school ball together. And it just made sense. And, when you know, when I heard them, uh, give me the praises of, of, of Don James and stuff. It just made sense to me that this was the university I needed to come to and play football for. 
Nice. Um, and you uh, must have had, you had a great career there at Washington. Uh, you're a member of the Washington Huskies Century Team. That uh, really. I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on every team that the Huskies have. Wow. And I did have a great career there. And, it, and I had a great career there because I played for a great, a great coach. Uh, Don James was not just about making us great football players, but uh, giving us values and, 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 and things that really made a lot of us become great men. Just uh, be responsible. And so it wasn't just about, I mean, in, in my experience as a, a division football player, you, you have coaches that will say to you that, you know, uh, they have all these values to play, but the reality is you can race the pillage as long as you can play well on Saturday. And Don James was not like that. He was about making us into good men, making us understand that not just football players. And, and that's the one thing that Probably to this day. That's awesome. Yeah. I would, say, I would say I'm grateful for him for that. Yeah, that's good. It's good to have a, a good coach like that, and uh, he, he sounds like a great guy. Um, oh, he was a great man. That's awesome. Uh, well, uh, so you had a great career there at Washington. Um, coming out of Washington, what was your mindset heading into the NFL? How how soon did you know into your Washington career that you could be a NFL player? Well, it was kind of funny. Uh, I ended up starting my freshman year. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of guys, you know, they assured me that I was going to the NFL. Mm -hmm. And my position was that if I could take it better, then my chances would be better that I would be able to play this NFL. Uh, when I played in, uh, in, in the Senior Bowl, that's when I knew for the first time how good I was because I, I had so many players talking to me about, uh, my play and how was I able to do this? How was I able to do that? So, I mean, I, I knew that when you play in the senior book of, of, of college football, and when you have other college football players all of a sudden gravitating around you, yeah. listening to the things you say, want to know how you're able to do this and how you're able to do that. That's that was the first time I realized how good I really was. <laughs> That's cool. It's, it's awesome to have your peers coming up to you like that and getting your advice. No, it and, is, especially in, especially in that game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so then you uh, you go to the draft. You get drafted in the eighth round, uh, two, number 207 overall. Oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold on, let's be clear. Yep. I, I got drafted in the eighth round because, unfortunately, I broke my ankle in the senior bowl. Oh. And uh, John Lope, who was the trainer, uh, had a conversation with me about that. And, and he told me that uh, when the, the coaches asked him about me even being able to play wow. my rookie year, he said, he said 70, 30, 60 to 40 that I wouldn't be able to play because of, of my injury. I shattered my ankle. I had a play in a six bruise put in it. But uh, he, he realized just how good I was uh -huh. when, and we're still talking, we still laugh about this. Mm -hmm. uh, after I broke my, I broke my ankle, uh, and I was able to play my rookie year, I remember he had a conversation with me, and he said that every time I would have a conversation with the coaches, and I would talk about an injury that you had sustained, and that how long you were going to be out, he said, I was always wrong. He said, you always came back faster. So he said, uh, fortunately for me, I had a body that was always able to heal itself at a faster rate than others. Uh -huh. and, and that was true. Uh, you know, whether, you know, I, I kind of fracturing my ankle I played on, I, uh, I broke my hand in, in August. Uh, the first game for September, they had it passed on, and I played the whole year with it. And he said, you didn't just play, you played well. And he said, you were able to block out all your injuries 
and play at a higher, higher level than, than most individuals that, that sustain a similar injury. Mm-hmm. So he stopped trying to calibrate or figure out how long I was going to be out because he said he was always wrong. Wow. That's incredible. I, I mean, along with that's, you know, some God given gifts, but that's also a credit to how hard you worked and how well you took care of your body at the same time. Well, 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 well you know, I, I always uh, uh, give credit to a guy by the name of Joe Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Washington was on the coast when I got there. And uh, I, first of all, I grew up in Compton, California, which you have to be to wear your surroundings and, and all those kind of things. And I always see Joe working on it for practice. So I asked him one day, I said, Joe, why do you always do extra stuff after practice? And I, I never forgot what he told me, because he was a little country, you know, but he said, Nancy, there's always something you can work on. There's always something you can get better at. So uh-huh. Joe actually taught me how to catch punts for one hand. He okay. said, if you can learn how to consistently catch punts for one hand, then catching it with two, with two hands is not an issue. And it was so true. And so every day after practice, after my rookie year, I would work out in Joe Washington. We'd run sprints and stuff. And and, and back then, unlike today, uh, you know, practice was more physical. Mm-hmm. I mean, we hit each other more. It was, it was just a more physical practice. And so the practice after practice was kind of like, wow. But I, I know because I did that with Joe, that enhanced my ability, gave me an opportunity to play as long as I did because uh, I also started working out uh, the second week of February. We didn't have training camp like that now. So most guys would work to March, week to March, or actually, you know, a couple of weeks before training camp, which always started in April, I would always start working out like Joe the second week of February. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible insight. Um, I mean, I think part of the reason with today's game, they don't practice as much as they used to. The game's not as physical. And it kind of allows people's bodies to, you know, the the hits hurt more, and they cause more injuries now. Well, well, you know what? And and, and I've said this for a long time now because uh, the, the one thing about us was that, you know, we always hit each other. That's the, but that builds a husk up mm-hmm. within our body where we could take those hits, and so we didn't have the same issue that a lot of guys have today because we were always thumping each other. Yeah. And uh, and I knew because that was something I did all the time that gave me a disadvantage because my body was for, you know, regular season game because we did hit each other all the time. We were physical all the time. And, and that was part of just uh, getting ready for the National Football League game because we hit so often in practice I mean, we do go line live on Friday. Wow. So, and I'm sure they don't do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but by doing that, that, that increases your ability to absorb those hits and continue to play. That's real cool. That's that's a real good insight there. Um, So then you get drafted by the Baltimore Colts. Um. This is interesting. Can you tell me a little bit what it was like going to the Baltimore Colts and then dealing with the whole transition moving to Indianapolis? Well, I mean, I mean, for, for me, I always knew it was a great opportunity. Okay, even let's go back to Washington. Even after I started my freshman year at Washington, mm-hmm. and the guy that I replaced ended up getting drafted by uh, the Atlanta Falcons. You know, all my guys on the team were saying, oh, man, you know you're going to the NFL. And the one thing I would always say to them, if I continue to work hard and get better, then that will increase my chances mm-hmm. of being able to, to play in the National Football League. You know, like right now, you know, I'm not ready. But if I continue to get better, you know, I, I will be ready. So I was, was always thinking about the future, and I was always preparing myself for the future. And that gave me a distinct advantage because uh, when you have the athleticism that I possess and then you work hard and, and you're one of the, the guys that that are in the best of shape anybody else the team, then you know that at the end of the day, you know, you, you really have a good chance of, of playing the National Football League. And so, and I, and I knew that as long as I was able to 
to work out at a high level and push myself and, and not just make this assumption because uh, I ended up being a senior that got drafted that the odds of me going to the NFL would be pretty good. But at the same time, I knew that hard work paid off and if I, and if I continue to work hard, then my chances of playing in the National Football League would be very good. And that's really what happened. I, I kind of uh, set myself up where it, it would be difficult for me not to play in the NFL, but I never said to myself, oh, I got it made in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great mindset to have because talent can get you only get you so far. It's that work ethic that puts you over the top. And a test. Well, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I always tell young guys, you know, what you hold between your what you hold between your ears will determine how far you go. Yeah. Yep. And uh, uh, you you were able to play 14 years in the NFL, a long career for a strong safety. Well, you know, hard hitting. You know, and, Yeah, that's incredible dedication, and uh, it's good to see that you had that type of mindset. And um, looking at your career stats here, you uh, led the Colts in tackles uh, 1981 through 1983, career 100, uh, 1,111 tackles, um, nine, nine career sacks, 15 career interceptions, 16 career fumble recoveries, as well as a great kick and punt returner. Um, incredible accolades. Um, well, you know, you know what's more than anything was that, uh, oh, also I was the defensive player for the Colts and the Seahawks, so I, I get to, to chime in with, with a bunch of different things, because there's not a lot of players that can say they were defensive player of the year for two different teams. Yeah, that's incredible. That's, uh, yeah, very few players. I don't know if, it can, if anyone can say that, maybe one or two, but. That's incredible. What uh, what was the transition when you uh, left Indy to go to Seattle? What was that decision like? Well, you know, I, I was what they call a strike casualty. Uh, the Cubs let me go in 1987, and they wanted me to retire and all that stuff wow. because they didn't want to make a big, they didn't want to make a big deal out of it. But that was the first time we were in the top ten in defense. And I remember talking to talking to the head coach and talking to uh, Jim Irsay, and and I, and I told both of them, I said, look, this is the first time I've been a part of the coach where we ended up defensively in the top ten. And guess what? I played a role in us being a top ten defense. And I said, if I had struggled uh, in 1987, uh, I would have said okay. But since I I did not play really good in 1987. I said, I'm going to give the rest of the teams in the NFL to see if they reach the same conclusion as you guys. Uh-huh. And uh, the, the Giants wanted me to, that's the Giants, sorry, the Jets, wanted, wanted me to go play for them. And at that point, we had just been a home in Seattle. And, you know, I wanted to relocate to Seattle. And I decided to pass up. And I called up uh, 
Chuck Norris, I mean the Chuck Norris, uh, Chuck Knox, mm -hmm. him, and, you know, I told him my situation, I told him that the Jets wanted to sign me, and, uh, and, and, and he was very honest and open with me, he said, man, look, we, you can't pay you the kind of money that the Jets are willing to pay you, but we can pay you this if that works for you, if you want to come play for us, and I said yes, because, it, it, you know, it wasn't as much as the Jets, but it was enough for me to come to Seattle. And, and, and play for the Seahawks because at that point in my career, it wasn't really about making as much money as I could. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Seattle was the, the city that I wanted to retire in, that I wanted to raise my kids and and my uh, ex-wife was from Tacoma. So it, it was just, for me at least, it just made sense for me to come back to the great Northwest because uh, I've always loved the great Northwest. When I came up here, uh, to play and the people that I've met. Uh, in fact, I, I, I told one of my sisters that I wasn't moving back to California, that I'm going to be in Seattle, and I'm still in Seattle. And I'm in Seattle because uh, there, there are so many great people in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I was downtown Seattle one time, and and it was a, a guy from somewhere else, and he looked like he was lost, and he was talking to, I heard, I heard, I heard the conversation, and he was, Asking the guy from Seattle, you know, how do you get to Pike, Pike Street Market? And the guy to really explain how to get there. I still wasn't sure. And the guy that he was talking to said, you know what? I don't have anything to do. I will walk you down there. Wow. And so, so when you see things like that, you know there are so many good people in Seattle. This is one of the best cities in America that you can grow up in or you can live in. And that's why I knew that I was in uh, one of the best parts of the country I could be in because people are so open and, 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 and so willing to do things and it has nothing to do with your race. It's like in Seattle, they're not going to, and, and it's a generalization, but most people aren't going to discount you because you don't look like them or talk like them. Mm -hmm. They're going to discount you because of your actions. And I, I always realized that about Seattle. I mean, it was one of the places, you know, that I experienced where people were open. They, they, they weren't prejudiced because you didn't look like them or talk like them. You know, they were prejudiced because you were a butto. You were doing stupid things. Yeah. That's cool. That's a, sounds like a great, great area. Um, yeah, that's incredible. I had, uh, two time defensive player of the year, man. That's a great, uh, accolade to have, um, with two different teams and a, a long productive career. Um, what are you? Uh, I heard that you were uh, coaching players uh, at Alabama and different places on how to get better mentally and focusing on mental health. Is that something you're still working on? Uh, no, I don't do that anymore. Unfortunately, I got diagnosed with cancer, so. Oh. Um, gee, but but no, don't 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 play the pity card. I mean, I'm doing well. Good. Uh, my doctor says he's never had a client that body has destroyed cancer the way my body is destroying cancer. So he says, hey, you know, uh, the mass in your stomach has shrunk in. I had six lesions in my liver. I'm down to four, which three are almost gone. So he, he is just like, you know, you keep doing what you're doing because your, your body is working overtime in terms of its ability to destroy cancer. Good. I, I'm glad to hear that, and I'll be praying for you. I, my, uh, I lost my mother to cancer, so I, I know what that battle is like. And, uh, well, I lost my dad to cancer, too. And my grandfather, was he had cancer, but he died when he was 86. So I'm going to be like my grandfather. Yeah, absolutely. That's good Good to hear, Nesby. Um, well, thanks so much for your time. It was a great interview. And uh, thanks so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to uh, come on the show with me. No worries. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, for all those out there that are dealing with cancer, it's what you hold between your ears that will get you through it. Because if you believe you can, you can. If you believe you can't, then guess what? You won't. Absolutely. Positive mindset. And uh, thanks so much again, Nesby. A great uh, great career. In my mind, you should be Hall of Famer. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. And have a great day, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. You take care. Yep, you as well. See ya. And that'll do it for the Alex Leak and Friends NFL Podcast. And we'll be back on next week with some more guests. And the season's right around the corner. 
Can't wait for the NFL to start. 2018 regular season week one starts tomorrow night. And uh, stay tuned. Don't forget to like, subscribe, or leave a comment. Peace out.